Hello, I'm David, and it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this district act of worship. The Chilean poet Pablo Neruda said, I want to do with you what spring does with the cherry trees. And in the readings from Acts today, which we shall be reflecting upon, we see God bringing a blossoming of love to bear on someone who needs it most. And I hope in this worship that will be your truth too, as our wonderful God of Easter blesses you with the blossom of his love. A prayer of adoration and confession. You are God, the one who brings us to new life, who transforms our relationships with our neighbours, who changes our use of this earth. 
as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, we bring again our adoration, our love for all that you are and all that you mean to us. Without you, we would not understand the fullness of human life. In Jesus, we see the kindness that you have for all people. And through your spirit, we can begin to reflect your character. And so we love and adore you. We praise and worship you. And we bring you our deepest longings and our unspoken prayers. But when we are faced with your immense kindness, we are very aware of our own failures. We know that there are many occasions when our lives do not reflect your love. Times when we have been judgmental, when we could not be bothered with those in need, when we prefer to live solely in our own bubbles with people like ourselves. Forgive our selfishness. Forgive our prejudices. Forgive our need to satisfy ourselves, whatever the cost to others. God of mercy, we trust that you are always ready to forgive, to renew and to restore. Help us to forgive others and to forgive ourselves. Then we can know your new life, your transformation, your renewal, and we can give you thanks and praise. In the name of Jesus, our holy, risen friend. Amen. Acts, chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I do, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognised him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. The story continues in Acts chapter 4, verses 5 to 22. The next day, the rulers, the elders and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, 
filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. And this man stands now before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called in it, them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him? You must be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old.
John's first letter, chapter 3, verses 16 to 18 and verse 23. I'm reading from the New International Version. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Hanami is the Japanese traditional custom of enjoying the transient spring beauty of blossom. Almost always refers to cherry blossom or less frequently plum trees. It's a beautiful word for a beautiful pastime, Hanami. Far from being a theological or doctrinal treatise, Acts of the Apostles is much more like a spiritual notebook of Hanami, picturing moment after wonderful moment of sightings of God's grace at work, as the Spirit enables love to blossom all around in an unfolding wave of beauty and hope. Our story from Acts today is one of blossoming against the odds, and as the drama unfolds, our attention is drawn to a quintet of interested parties whose actions take centre stage as we look for the blossom of divine love all around. And the first of these interested parties, the Bible tells us, is a man who was lame from birth. Now this unnamed man has lived his whole life with a disability and with a disability in a society that has no welfare provision, which means that one way or another he is utterly reliant on the generosity of others. He's always vulnerable, placing himself and his need in very public view, doing whatever it takes to survive. He begs, and in so doing begs the question of those who pass by, there but for the grace of God go you, each one of you, so put yourself in my place and experience my truth for yourself. Hold that thought. This man is not an incidental detail in the story. He's not an extra, a background artist in this two-act drama. He is the story. He is its very focus. He is the one whom God wants to blossom. As everyone who passes by literally looks down upon him, in his eyes looking up we see God's blossom-laden yearning, looking right back. A person living with disability in first century Jerusalem, or an asylum seeker in your town whose first language isn't English, who was a professional in Syria, but who is now regarded with suspicion and contempt by those who resent their presence amongst us. Whichever one you choose, they are the centre of God's concern. Hold that thought too. The man with the disability was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, the story tells us. And so now we turn to a small detail which is almost lost in the narrative, but is such an important one. There were those who carried him every day. Each and every day, his family and friends perhaps, would loyally take him out and bring him back in a real act of devotion and care. Just as we would if we were in their place, caring for someone we love as much as they clearly did or wanting to help a neighbour in need, perhaps. 
In this incidental but crucial detail, we see the whole world of kindness, compassion and care that goes on all the time under the everyday surface of society. Good people doing good things out of the kindness of their hearts, a real blossoming of all that is beautiful in humanity. In the Hanami of the text, they may be unnamed, but they matter, because in the blossom of their love, God is present. Then the text goes on to say this. When he was put there every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. So every day he's put there to beg from those going in and out of the temple. And here we meet the faithful who time and again walk up the steps of the temple to cross that ancient threshold between the quotidian and the sacred, the commonplace and the exclusive, people like us, you and me, looking for meaning, purpose and hope in their house of God, just as we do in ours, whether in person or latterly digitally. They make the journey from out here in community to in there in church in the hope that in so doing they and their world will be transformed even if just a bit at a time i wonder what their expectations are as they cross the threshold to the temple are they any different to ours what are they asking god to do what difference does their faith make to them and those around them in what ways are they responding to God's promptings? As we look at them in the narrative, we are drawn intimately close to the truth of our own spirituality. And in so doing, the God of promise and new life draws intimately close to us. And in our searching and our wondering, we scent the fresh blossom of resurrection. So now that we are mindful of three of the interested parties in this drama and having caught sight of Blossom we recognise, we move on to the two people who really catch our eye in the narrative, to Peter and John. The Bible text says this, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. It sounds also matter of fact, doesn't it? Yet this is such an astounding declaration. Peter and John go to the temple of all places in broad daylight and he heal a lame person who was begging there. This is something that was unimaginable before Easter. This post-Pentecost chance encounter becomes a glorious moment of Hanami as we gaze upon a dazzling missional set piece, as Peter says, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now given all that has happened beforehand, this is truly astonishing. As we read the text, we do a double take. How did these two get from there frightened despair at the foot of the cross, to hear, confident, bold, full of faith, in public. What on earth happened to transform them so utterly, and indeed so publicly? In a preeminent moment of Hanami, we see Peter and John being breathtakingly and wonderfully who the risen Jesus calls them to be. Like cherry blossom, they stand out and hold our attention in the spring sunshine. The beauty of their words and actions is like blossom, it's self-evident. It lifts our spirits and conveys a deep sense of hope and new life, of fresh beginnings and of recreation all around us. It is what we long for. Moreover, it is who we long to be. For this is what Easter faith looks like in a Good Friday world. As we emerge from the pandemic, this is the blossom the world so desperately needs. 
Yet just as the blossom is vulnerable to the blast of this April's cold, icy winds and snow, so too the emerging blossom of the post-Easter faithful in Acts seems particularly vulnerable to the very forces that put Jesus to death in the first place. How could it be otherwise? And once Peter and John's faith blossoms into public view, the opposition set to work to nullify this unwanted intrusion. So our final interested parties make their dubious entrance. The Bible tells us the rulers, the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. So were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. What happens next is truly extraordinary and unexpected. Once again, our Easter Hanami has the power to astonish and impress. In this amazing story, far from being cowed and beaten, we see Peter and John shaming the elite, the entitled and the privileged, speaking ferocious godly truth to the power and vested interests of the political and religious chumocracy. They resist all attempts to bully, intimidate and curtail their words and actions of protest and hope. Peter and John stand firm and declare it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So awake in Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit, shining bright with kindness, the apostles refuse to be dismissed for being woke. The tomb is empty and everything has changed. They are truly awake to the revolutionary importance of the resurrection and live in the power of the risen Christ. The clock can't be turned back to Good Friday the facts cannot be ignored. History will not be airbrushed. The truth will be told of how God came to set the people free. All people, every person, once and for all. And of how the imperial system was rigged to disadvantage the ordinary people who were subjugated and burdened as non-entities to feed the insatiable desire of the privileged elites of Rome's empire. Small wonder then that in Jesus God's Hanami promises of life in its fullness for all was so disruptive that in the end the death-dealing mechanisms of imperial cruelty tried to extinguish it once and for all, tried and failed because in the gift of the risen Jesus from the heart of eternity to the kind hearts of the faithful, God demonstrably disarms such evil with the power of love and establishes the only kingdom that will last. It is within this truth and from this truth and for this truth that Peter and John and their Easter contemporaries burn with an unstoppable godly desire to establish God's kingdom and what today we might call new places for new people. In Acts we see how the early church moves beyond the sterile steps of the temple and out into their communities to connect, awaken, enthuse and include all who recognise their need of the gospel. All of a sudden, Blossom is seen everywhere and in the most unexpected of places. And in so doing, these apostles are the progenitors of our own reawakening passion for mission and evangelism today. In the Acts of the Apostles, 
we see an unstoppable movement of kindness, action and truth. In the lives of the early Jesus movement, we see an astonishing blossoming of dazzling spiritual hanami, which ignites faith, belonging and belief in a better world, and as such is a nuisance and always disruptive to those whose instincts are conservative and traditional, because you can't constrain, limit, police or prohibit the Holy Spirit. And one way or another, the apostles are living proof that God will do what God wants to do, with us or without us. The sooner the powers that be wake up to that, the better. But for the early church, what matters is not conformity, but conversion. Not compliance, but healing. Not silence, but testimony. Not deference to a few, but dignity for all. These ordinary, flawed women and men are God's beautiful, radical, everyday revolutionaries, remaking the world right under the noses of the oppressors. They say, do Peter and John, which is right in God's eyes, they say, to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So what is truly awesome is to watch through the pages of the Acts of the Apostles as a movement energised and envisioned by the Holy Spirit and compelled to mission and evangelism begins to inhabit and own its God-given identity and purpose. It's like watching the blossom bursting forth all around us in spring, called into life by the warmth of the sun. It will happen and we will see it. And notice it is the acts of the apostles, not the apathy of the apostles or the playing it safe strategies of the apostles or the timidity of the apostles or worse still, the defeatism of the apostles. No, nope. it's acts by name and acts by nature, and we are following in their footsteps. In his BAFTA Fellowship acceptance speech earlier this month, the Taiwanese film director Ang Lee spoke about, and I quote, the courage to open ourselves to truth. What a marvellously telling phrase that is. What happens when we do this is precisely what we see unfolding brilliantly in this story from Acts. Having the courage to open themselves to the life-changing truth of the risen Christ transforms Peter and John in the most astonishing way, just as failing to do so imprisons the temple elite in a life-sapping cycle of denial and refutation. The courage to open ourselves to truth is at the heart of our relationship with God. It is the essential pivot point which determines our spiritual journey. And it is exactly this hanami of courage and truth that so transforms Peter and John. So what object lessons can we learn from the blossoming of these two awesome disciples which might shape our choices now? Well, they have confidence in God. They are proud and visible as followers of Jesus. They believe Jesus can transform people's lives and they instinctively put this belief into practice when they encounter someone in need. They hold nothing back and they're extravagantly generous and unexpectedly kind and they show God's Hanami generosity and kindness are for everyone. A church that longs for a hanami of blossoming and growth looks just like this. And in 1 John we read this. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and to love one another as he commanded us. 
a church that has the courage to open themselves to this truth is one that is rediscovering the spine-tingling immediacy of the Holy Spirit at work. And such a church is open to a much more uncomfortable truth too, one embedded in the person of the lame beggar. Let's just think about this. Having a disability since birth, the man is put on the steps of the temple every day by his friends to beg in a spot designed to maximise the economic benefit to be derived from that guaranteed footfall of faithful passers-by. But this act is by its very nature repetitive and because it's repetitive day in day out it calls into question the very existence of utility of what happens in there in the temple for all the people out here in the community because the man is left stranded in poverty his life isn't transformed his potential isn't realized and released by the faith of those who climb the steps to worship or those who perform the rituals within whether they are coming in or going out none of the people who frequent the temple can intervene in a way that will liberate this poor man put bluntly the persistent presence of the lame beggar on the steps of the temple shames an impotent and irrelevant religious institution. He is very visibly an uncomfortable truth, which says that what happens in there has no relation to life out here. In this crucial respect, those steps are portrayed as being devoid of Hanami. There is no blossom to see until the day Peter and John in their Easter faith come by. So what of today? What happens on and beyond the steps of our churches is what God is calling us to see. We're invited to have the courage to be open to this most uncomfortable truth. Our focus is not in here, in church, but out there, just as it was for Jesus, and just as it was for the early Jesus movement. It is out there in our communities that we are expected to discover and celebrate the blossoming of love, kindness and hope. In this story, God asks us to stand on the steps between church and community and honestly ask ourselves if what happens in there has an impact on what we do out here and how the views of those out there impact on those of us in here how are we seen i wonder if we find that we are seen as impotent and irrelevant to how life is lived today what are we to do about it are we to rage and lash out in denial and keep everything as it is because it works for us just like those who oppose the disciples so bitterly or are we as easter people to follow in the footsteps and of peter and john people of kindness action and truth energized and inspired by god to make his hanami real and apparent where it is most needed a church that looks lovingly beyond its buildings to its community and freely says in the name of Jesus Christ what we have we give to you what an incomparable display of an army that will be God bless
our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Generous God, this is where our thanks begin, that you, the glorious divinity, came in Jesus, willing to suffer the pain and indignity of the cross for us, to lay down your life for us. This reveals the full extent of your love, and we are thankful. We believe that your love extends to all, and so our prayers must be for all people, for those like us, sharing our easy lives, and for those who are very different from us, for those who struggle, who are resentful and angry, those who are confused or terrified. We pray for all who will go hungry today, for those on our streets and for those in countries very different from our own. We pray for all who live in fear, for those in homes like ours and for those who live in communities torn apart by violence. We pray for all who are ill, worried about their futures and that of their families. For those who are waiting for treatment and for those who have no prospect of healing. We pray for all who are disturbed with minds unsure about themselves or their futures and especially for those who are struggling as a result of the Covid pandemic. We pray for ourselves. You know our private worries and we are thankful. Generous God, this is where our prayers begin, with your love, as revealed in Jesus, the one like us, and yet the one far beyond us. And we are thankful. Amen.
God has blessed you in this act of worship with the wonderful Hanami of his love. And so, a blessing to send us out into the communities where God wants us to be a people of Hanami, pointing out and being the blossom of all that is good and wonderful in our lives with Jesus. So may the blessing of God, the giver of life, the bearer of pain and the maker of love be your joy, your delight and your inspiration today and forever. Amen. God bless everyone.